Good day to you, Alex. How are you? Are you fitting well? I'm very well, thank you, Colin. How are you doing? I'm good. Sum summer's about upon us. Yeah, you'll be getting the shorts out <laughs> soon, eh? I don't know about soon. They're actually on now, but we won't go into that. Um, usually when we see each other, it's obviously much colder and it's under the bright lights of the exhibitions at a place in the sun. That's right, yeah. So it's good to see, good to see you remotely here in Spain, eh? <laughs> Um, one of the things I wanted to discuss with you, Alex, we're getting record number of inquiries with regards to people uh, wanting to relocate to Spain, which, hey, uh, how could you blame them, eh? Yeah. Um, now, obviously, af after Brexit, um, things have become, you know, a little bit more difficult and there's certain things that we need to be aware of and we're forever getting questions about visas. Now, one of the things I wanted to discuss today by far, and, and you can maybe tell me the statistics, but my understanding is, is by far the most common visa out there is the non-lucrative visa or the NLV. Um, outranks all of the visas by, by some measures. Um, the vast majority of the clients that we speak to would fall into this category of um, applying for an NLV. So I just maybe wanted to, uh, with your permission, fire some questions at you and have a bit of a discussion to help everybody understand the intricacies of, of the non-lucrative visa, if we may. Yeah, sure, far away. Perfect. Um, the obvious place to start is, is who really is the NLV most appropriate for? What kind of person is, is going to be the archetypal applicant for an NLV? Okay, so, so basically, you know, Post-Brexit, Brits are restricted to 90 days in 180 days. So they've got to leave after those 90 days. If they want to spend longer, then they've got to apply for a visa. And like you say, the most popular visa is the non-lucrative visa. And that visa basically means that people can, people from outside of Europe, so non-Europeans, or you know, arguably the Great Britain is still in Europe, but we're not part of the EU. Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, Brits, Canadians, Americans, uh, New Zealanders, uh, Australians, they, as non-Europeans, Chinese, et cetera, would have to apply for a non-lucrative visa to come to Spain to spend more than 90 days, right? And the process is that they have to apply for the, that visa from the Spanish consulate in their home country okay. and they and they get that visa they come to Spain and they are not allowed to work so they're actually retiring and residing in Spain okay so that's maybe where the kind of other name that it gets it's often referred to as the retirement visa yeah so that, that that's obviously where that comes from you, you mentioned there then Alex about applying for that within your own country so let's talk about the uk market here because that's who we predominantly service yeah. um where would those offices be in the uk then so basically there's, there's three spanish consulates in the uk there's one in london there's one in manchester and there's one in edinburgh and obviously okay. they have their they have their catchment areas so depending where your clients are living in the uk they would go to each one of those uh, consulates Ah, so you would actually visit your closest as the crow flies, if you like, your, your nearest office. Correct, okay. yeah, yeah. That's you. So thanks for that, Alex. Um, that's maybe somebody who should be considering it. Who really wouldn't fit the brief, if you like? Who really shouldn't be considering an NLV? So anyone who wants to work in Spain shouldn't, shouldn't consider the NLV. Okay. However, having said that, what can happen is that um, you can actually apply for the non-lucrative visa and after a year, you could change it over to a work visa, okay? okay. So you'd, you'd have to receive a, 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 an employment offer. But yet by and large, Colin, our clients are moving to Spain, aren't working, so the NLV yeah. would be the correct visa. Perfect. Thank you for that, Alex. So we might have ascertained that a non-lucrative visa might be the right path of action for somebody then. Um, tell us a bit about the qualification criteria. What what what, are, what certain tests do we need to pass, if you like? Okay, so so basically, what do you need? So again, if they go onto our website, the top right-hand corner of the website, we've got useful information. And obviously now we can they can visit our YouTube channel and your YouTube channel and view this video. But mm -hmm. there's, there's we've got legal advice downloads there, and we've got we keep our non-lucrative visa leaflet fairly up to date um, so people can go in there and download it. This is what they would need. They would need one, a Spanish address. 
okay? okay. They would need an address, and that address, Colin, you know, they that could be the address of the, that, well, usually it's the address of the property they're going to buy, all right? Yeah. They would need, obviously, their, their address in their home country. Yeah. Depending on their age, if they are ref retirement age, then they can apply for Form S1, mm -hmm. which will which will provide them with med medical cover here in Spain. Okay. If they're under retirement age, then they would need private medical insurance, and we can introduce them to insurers or sorry, insurance brokers yeah. who can provide them with quotes for that insurance. Okay. And and you mentioned there about retirement age. I guess that's state retirement age then. Yes, sixty-seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then, but we have had, for example, you know, someone who's married, someone who's of retirement age, married to say someone who's slightly younger. Um, when they apply for that form S one, they can add a beneficiary, um, even if that person is younger to them. But by and large, that beneficiary, you know, is their partner or married to them. Okay. Okay, so that's quite an important one then. So only one of, if you're a married couple, only one of them needs to be of state retirement age. Yes, yeah. Ah, perfect. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Okay, but it is it is quite important because they, they can both plug into the Spanish healthcare system and they wouldn't then need private medical insurance. Okay. All right. The next, the next document they would need is they need a clean medical certificate. So basically they would, We've got the wording for this certificate. They'd go along to their GP and say, look, I need this certificate to really to confirm that I don't suffer from any World Health Organization nasty illnesses like syphilis and typhoid, uh, okay. that, that, that all, sort of all, stuff. All, you know? all the good stuff. <laughs> all, all the good stuff, yeah. Um, and then a clean criminal record certificate. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we do get clients contact us, Colin. They said, look, you know, I did something naughty when I was younger at school, et cetera. You know, smoked a joint behind the the you know the the the, 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 the bike you know, sheds. The bike sheds. So, you know, if it's going back 17, 20 years, they don't have to worry about it. But the Spanish mm -hmm. authorities typically go go back five years. All right. Okay. So after five years, then 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 that basically conviction or misdemeanor, whatever they got up to, is spent, and they don't have to worry about it. Okay. Okay. So they, the authorities go back to five years. If it's a single person applying. Um, then they would need to prove that they've got sufficient financial resources. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But mm. if it's a married couple, then they would need a duplicate marriage certificate. Uh, okay. I was speaking to someone earlier today, British couple, they got married in America. So they would have to apply for a duplicate marriage certificate from the States. Um, and that certificate has to be within the last three months. So by the time the application is submitted, uh, it has to be dated within the last three months. So timing is is quite important. And again, imagine, we yeah. would we would help the clients with that. Okay. Okay. Um, if they've got children, then then basically they would need duplicate birth certificates. And again, dated within the last three months. Okay. What about Alex? Um, so you mentioned married couples there, and what what, what about a non-married couple? Does that cause more complexity or? Well, what it does, it means that they've got to prove that they've got more financial resources. So, which leads me on to financial resources. Okay. So, typ typically, um, uh, a kind of a individual applicant would need about twenty eight thousand eight hundred euros in a bank account, right? Okay. And that can be a combination of savings, income from rental properties, or investments. Right. But it can't be earnings because you're not allowed to work. Yeah. Right. So so if you had two individual applicants, you know, and they're unmarried partners, then they would have twenty eight thousand eight hundred euros each to prove. Right. Okay. For a married couple, it's thirty six thousand euros. Okay. Right. For a family of four, you're talking fifty thousand four hundred euros. Okay? okay, and these figures are reviewed on an annual basis and go up in line with inflation. Okay, right now, so basically, we would help them with the documentation. They they present, they would present their document. They'd apply for an appointment at the consulate. They go along with their documentation, all printed and nicely ordered. They would say to the you know here, Mr. Consulate, here is my documentation. Yes, yes, yes. When do you want to move to Spain? I want to move to Spain in three months time great um they would then usually the passport is retained and 
they would be grant that in say a week or two weeks time they would be sent their passport with the visa on it for the date that they want to come into spain okay and they would then basically come out to spain and we would book them an appointment with a town hall and we would register on the padron which is the local census yeah once they're registered on the local census we would then apply for an appointment for them at the foreigner's office and they would go along to the foreigner's office with with kind of with the correct forms that we would supply for, to them uh, a passport photo and obviously their passport showing they've got the visa and we would apply for their tie for them okay and then typically they would then have to go back say a week or 10 week days later or up to four weeks later to collect their tie and their tie mm -hmm is the foreigner's identity card, okay? And this visa, the non-lucrative visa, is granted for one year, okay? And then it is renewed in Spain. So after a year, it's renewed in Spain. And the bad news, Colin, is that the clients then have to go back and prove that they've got sufficient financial resources to live on for two years because the renewal is granted for two years. So if you've got two individual applicants they need to prove that they've got 28,800 euros each, right? Yeah. Whereas, for example, the married couple have only got to prove that they've got 36,000 euros times two. Yeah. Um, you know, one 36,000 for each year. And if, for example, someone's receiving a pension, let's just say they're receiving a pension of 20,000 and they've got to prove 36,000, they would then, they could top up Proof, proof for the financial resources with savings okay yeah. so you, you you can see there quite obviously why this is really designed for people who are at retirement age if if you had no income whatsoever you would have to have an enormous pot of money to support you over that period of time wouldn't you yeah you'd, you'd, you've got to have a lot of money in the bank account or you've got to have um you know investments or income from yeah, some form properties. of passive income yes yeah yeah yeah, okay. Um, you mentioned, we, we touched on healthcare a little bit earlier, Alex. So obviously for, for anybody who's going to move to Spain and have obviously had the comfort, irrespective of what you think of the NHS, you know, it, it, it's a fantastic organisation. Um, we've had, obviously, both being born in the UK ourselves, we've had the comfort of the NHS for a long time. How does the Spanish healthcare system differ to that of the UK then? I, I, I listen. I, I think it's a national health service, and it's very good. It's very, you know the Spanish national health service is very good, and if you can plug in to the national health service here in Spain, then I'd recommend that you do that because if you have you know if you suffer from a nasty illness or an accident, then it's better to go to the national health service um, uh, unless you've got very deep pockets and you go privately. Mm -hmm. So the other thing you can do, Colin, is after year one on the healthcare service. Once you've been on the padron, the census for one year, if you were if you were under the age of retirement, so you've got private medical insurance, yeah. after after a year of being on the padron, you can switch over to what's known as the convenio especial, which mm -hmm. means that you pay you pay monies to the Spanish healthcare system to be registered. Okay, okay. Um, and that's typically about sixty euros a month per person. It might work okay. out cheaper than private medical insurance. Okay. okay, that's relatively inexpensive. Exactly. I mean, in my situation, you know, we're registered with the Spanish healthcare system, but also we have top up private medical insurance for quick appointments, quick, you know, quick, um, you know, if you need a, a blood test, etc, you can get yeah, that yeah. done quickly on the private medical insurance. Yeah, I, I, I have to say my experience of the Spanish healthcare system is only a positive one. Um, if if it means anything, you know, Spain is a vast country in size, yet the population is only 44, 45 million. So I think because of that, the, the healthcare system, certainly from what I've seen of it, doesn't seem to be overrun in any way like it is in other areas. No, exactly. I mean, it, you know, it probably varies region to region, but generally speaking, you know, we, we've, we've, again, after, you know, 30 years plus in Spain, <laughs> we've, we've had a good experience. Yeah. Okay, I, I would I would very much advocate that. Um, one of the things that we get an awful lot of, and, and the vast majority of our clients who relocate to Spain, um, obviously already have property in the UK, and part of the process of moving 
you know, there's, there's many moving parts, if you like, but one major part of that is selling their property in the UK. How important or how critically important is timing in all of this then, Alex? Well, it's critical. It's absolutely critical because as you and I have discussed in the past, um, in Spain, when you move to Spain, the tax year is runs from January to December. Yeah. And if you spend more than 183 days in Spain, then you become a Spanish tax resident and you'll pay tax on worldwide assets and income. So if someone arrives in Spain in September, because there's not 183 days left, they won't become a Spanish tax resident in that year. But the following year, they will. Now, Spain does actually tax individuals on any gains that they make from the sale of their main residence, mm -hmm. unless, unless you invest, reinvest all the proceeds of sale into a new property. So for example, someone comes and buys a property with, with welcome estates here in Spain, they've got their property here, then they sell at their UK property and move to Spain. Spain would treat that property in Spain as their main residence and the sale of their UK property as a second residence. If they've made a gain on that sale, then they would tax them. However, if, for example, they hadn't, didn't have a property yet and they were selling their UK property and investing all the sales proceeds into the new one, again, there wouldn't be any tax. But, for example, if you are selling up in the UK and coming to Spain, I would always advise don't spend 183 days in that year in Spain if you've made a gain on sale of a UK property. So don't become a Spanish tax resident in the same year of sale of the UK property to avoid potential having to, potentially having to pay capital gains tax. So you could sell your property now in, say, in June and move to Spain in September. Again, not enough, not, not 183 days, so you don't have to worry about the CGT issue. So this is a really important point, Colin. It's all about, it's all about timing, you know? It, it smacks of getting all your ducks lined up in a row before you even start the process, isn't it? It's, it's, I suppose, an accident waiting to happen if you stumble into this by accident. Um, but, I, I, you know, what, what I've taken from what you've said there, you know, paying capital gains tax on that property is voluntary. If, if you do the correct planning, there is no need to at all. Exactly. So... Just I spoke speaking to someone today, you know, they were hoping to sell their property end of last year. They've moved out to Spain. Unfortunately, the sale didn't happen. Now they've they're now in Spain. And they, they they're gonna spend 183 days here. That person mm -hmm. will be taxed on any gain that they've made on the sale of their UK property because mm -hmm. they've they've sold they've sold their Spanish their UK property in the same year yeah. as they become a Spanish tax resident here, yeah. already having a property here. If you're moving to Spain. You know, just time it carefully. And you know, obviously we're happy to speak to clients about that beforehand um, when we do that on a regular basis, Colin. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think one major thing for myself as well, Alex, we, we touched on. And, and one of the biggest things that a client will always ask is, is the financial requirements. And we get a lot of inquiries where clients will say, I've got X amount of money. But really, a, a lot of those people might meet the initial criteria to get into Spain, but we have to be very mindful of those ongoing tests because the last thing we want to do is to have somebody here who qualify for a visa and then they fail the tests, the ongoing tests because they don't have sufficient income or savings, etc. Yes. Um, yeah. So I, you know my, my advice to anybody would be, you know, you have to take a holistic advice to understand the entire picture. It's not just about getting to Spain. It's being able, being able to legally live here whilst you're under an NLV and and be you know be able to pass those tests on going to be able to stay here. Yeah, exactly. And and, and for example, you know, you're moving to Spain. Um, so so obviously you know, you know, that's quite stressful moving to Spain. It's <laughs> yes. you, know, you know, buying a buying buying a house and moving house is 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 stressful. But buying a selling a house in, in the UK, buying a house in Spain, moving to Spain, there's a lot of stress for that. So you just, you know, timing and knocking things off the checklist is a good idea. And also bear in mind, Colin, those clients might have, you know, financial products such as ISAs, et cetera. Those mm. products, when you move to Spain, because you're no longer a UK tax resident, mm. they, you, they, you cease to have the tax advantages you've enjoyed up until the point that you leave. So Indeed. you've got to, 
you know, another part, a bit of advice would be talk to financial advisors based in Spain yeah. about moving those products over. Good, good advice. Great advice. Um, so to summarize, then, if we could kind of wrap this up in a nice little nutshell. Yep. So an NLV is for really designed for people who don't need to work. And they don't need to work by virtue of they have a large enough uh, passive income, such as pensions, investments, rental properties. Um, they can support themselves from an income perspective going forward. They meet the criteria of, uh, of not having a criminal record in the last few years. And they can support themselves through healthcare, be it through an S1 or be it through private medical insurance. Yeah, that's a good nutshell. Excellent. Well, I think we've covered everything, Alex. Yeah. Um, as always, that was very uh, pertinent. Excellent advice. Um, as a non-lawyer, my advice to anybody is take advice as soon as you possibly can. Um, my biggest piece of advice to anybody is, is myself and Alex are talking to, from two very different ends of the spectrum. Um, I'm an estate agent, therefore, often at the very end of the process where somebody is actually going to move to Spain and going to buy a property. My advice would always be is to take expert legal advice long before you even think about doing it. So you know that you've got all your ducks lined up in a row before you get anything wrong. Alex, have yourself a great day. It's always nice seeing you. Likewise. Have a good one, Colin. Get those shorts on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.